Here at Why Dance Matters, the Royal Academy of Dance podcast, we talk about dance and movement and physical expression, but all we can use are words. That's the gorgeous paradox of it, the way our guests conjure the power of dance through conversation. This episode has a head start in word spinning because our guest is a poet, the resonant, rousing, heart-stopping Benjamin Zephaniah. I'm David Jays and I'm looking forward to this one. Benjamin's specific dance connection is that he's recorded the narration for Ron Bear's acclaimed new stage production, Peaky Blinders, based on the cult period TV drama about stylish criminality between the wars. Benjamin, who played Jeremiah Joseph in the series, doesn't appear alongside Ron Bear's dancers, but as a celebrated performance poet, he's used to making language, voice and physicality fuse in the most memorable of ways. And as Professor of Creative Writing at Brunel University, he helps the next wave of performance poets find their voice and the physical means to express it. I want to ask Benjamin about words and bodies and the way that creativity can change a life. This is the last episode of this season of Why Dance Matters. It should be a good one. Benjamin, thank you so much for joining us on Why Dance Matters. You are a very physical performer and performance poetry. It's about your incredible words and it's about your rich and resonant voice. But of course, it's also about that physical presence. Was that always something that came easily to you? I am literally dancing as I perform my poetry because I never in my early days thought of poetry as something that just lived on the page. When I was creating a piece of poetry, and I say creating rather than writing, a lot of it wasn't written down. I would always imagine myself facing the audience. So if this is not just reciting a poem, it's performing a poem, how do I put my whole body into it? As I'm creating a poem, I know what I'm going to be doing with my eyes. I know what I'm going to do with my hands. There's a sense of rhythm. Am I going to be bouncing on the rhythm? All these things come together in poetry that is really created for performance rather than the book. Now, obviously, I do write poetry that stays in the book and really doesn't work that well in performance. But most of my poetry, and I would argue, the best of my poetry is performance poetry. And and it's nice that you make that distinction between creating poetry rather than writing poetry. Does that mean that that act is a physical one for you? You're not sitting at your desk, you're sort of bouncing around the room. Um, yes, sometimes I'm bouncing down the street. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I mean, no, I, 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 had, I have a poem called Money. Oh, yeah. Which is a very fast, rhythmic poem. Yeah. Money make a rich man feel like a big man. They make a poor man feel like a hooligan. A one parent family feel like a ruffian. And those who have it won't give you anything. Money makes your friend become your enemy. You start seeing things very superficially. Your life is lived very artificially, unlike those who live in poverty. And it goes on. It's a very long poem. Now, it's a very complex poem in terms of rhythm and in terms of what it's saying, it, especially at a time like now. I mean, I wrote it 20 years ago, but you know, now everybody talk about the cost of living. What kind of system do we have? I don't want to get too heavy and too political here, but what kind of system do we have, not just in this country, but all over the world, when we know there's enough food in the world for everybody, we know there is enough space for everybody, but because people don't have the right amount of money, (laughs) this thing that we've invented, they starve and die or they go without. And I remember once somebody saying to me, they're working hard to earn, earn a living, but they don't have much time to live. And I thought, wow. So one day I'm jogging and I literally, I could hear my feet on the ground. And that's when the poem came. So you see, that's a very long explanation to explain something which which I really wanted to illustrate. You're right, not just bouncing around the room. I bounce down the street. Sometimes I'm in the gym and poetry comes to me. And that poem was created and performed 
for years before I ever wrote it down. My publisher had to twist my arm to write it down because I said, it doesn't work that well on the page. They said, come on, Benjamin, just put a little explanation. Just say it's a piece written for performance. And that's what uh, I did in the book. You know, my poetry comes from this tradition, which is more allied to music and dance than it is to literature. And sometimes it's hard for Western people to understand that. But I always say that the, the big difference is if I'm in countries where the oral tradition is really strong and I say I'm a poet, they don't say, oh, darling, what have you had published? <laughs> they say, do one, do one. Let me give you some room, let me give you some room, do one. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing, isn't it? And that idea that it lives as much in your head and in your body as it does on, on a page or between covers. That's quite strong, isn't it? It has its good points and it has a little weakness. The good points are it's something within the community. It's something that, especially nowadays, you can, you can go and watch a film or you can go to a disco, you can go and watch some performance poetry. You literally watch it and listen to it. And one of the other great things is we know that when a government really wants to come down and oppress people, one of the first things they do is start burning the books. Well, if poetry is kept in performance and kept in the hearts and the minds of the people, it's very difficult to get it out of there. One of the weaknesses is, and our generation don't have the same problem, but one of the weaknesses used to be that when the poet or the people who created the poetry passed on and died, sometimes that tradition could go away. Not all the time, sometimes it's carried on. But nowadays, we put something online and it's out of our control. People have got it forever somewhere in Silicon Valley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. I mean, I teach performance poetry at Brunel University. And when I, a lot of the students are young and a lot of them will say, oh, spoken word, it's a new thing. And I go, no. It's the oldest thing. I think it's, it's like one of the oldest art forms we were ever doing. And when you're teaching performance poetry, I mean, it's not just like teaching creative writing. It's about performance. It, 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 do people find it easy to kind of step up and have that confidence to take a room by storm? Well, there's a whole mixture of people. Some do, some don't. But one of the first things I do when I start the term is I will ask the students why they chose this course. And you get a whole mixture of responses. Some will say, I'm shy and I want to build my confidence. Some will say, I want to teach children or, you know, I want to teach adults or whatever. And I just want to get more practice of standing in front of people. And some will say, I want to speak to the world and change the world. <laughs> and some will say, Talking about dance, I had a lady once who came from the Indian tradition of Kathak dancing, is it called? She wanted to do that at the same time as she was doing poetry. She wanted to blend them. I actually had a friend, a poet in Manchester called Anja Malik. She was of Pakistani origin and she did that. She literally did Kathak dancing. And as she was dancing, she spoke the poetry in Urdu and it really worked. It was hard work. <laughs> it <was> work. <laughs> <laughs> and it must be quite exciting for you as their professor to sort of see people over the year become more physically confident and become more happy in themselves. It's a beautiful thing, you know. I mean, I left school at 13, unable to read and write. My past was not in the arts in the early days or academia. You know, I lived under wrong side of the law and all that kind of stuff. And literally arts saved my life. When I stand in front of my students and I tell them on paper, you are all more educated than me, but I'm your professor. How did I get here? You know, and I'll talk about changing your life and what arts can do for you. And then when I see art change their life, how do I see that? I'm walking down the road and I see a poster and it's one of my ex-students in performance and I go, wow, yeah, well, I see them on television. It's like my children. And, and, and I, mean, I, I mean that quite seriously. I don't know if you've read recently. And I mean, over the years, I've been writing a lot about male infertility. I cannot have children. Recently, I wrote a piece and, you know, it got a really good response. And people since then have been asking me, you know, 
to reach my age and be childless, what is it like? And I used to take it personal before. I, mean, I really used to think, you know, I have to have children. Now I think other people have had children and I've raised them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Because I've added to their kind of intellectual experience, their physical experience. When we do performance poetry and when we get them to stand there, and a lot of these people are doing poems about body sh shaming and, and issues with weight and issues with race and things like this, sexuality and gender. And they are able to open up in front of me and therefore in front of an, an, another audience because their exam is in front of an audience. It's such a beautiful thing, I tell you. I mean, I feel like I've raised hundreds of children, just really big children. <laughs> 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 and it's when it's bringing all the conversations that are actually really difficult to have with your biological parents they can have with you yes so. <laughs> yes yes and actually i mean within my own family this may sound slightly weird but i don't allow my nieces and nephews to call me uncle they just call me benjamin you know and it's just benjamin the poet and you know and i tell you it does allow them to talk to me in ways that they can't talk to my brothers and sisters, their parents about, because they see me as their mate. They see me as somebody that thinks about issues, that's open-minded, and I am not part of a hierarchy. If the time comes and I have to tell them to shut up, then <laughs> you know, I'll do that. But, you know, I'm a, I'm a very good listener. And I also remember my youth very well, you know, my teenage years and I don't remember details, but I remember emotions I was feeling and what I was going through and how lonely I felt sometimes. And like I said, I remember what art did for me and the things that literally saved my life. It does feel sad that you weren't encouraged at school. You had, I think, undiagnosed dyslexia, but still no teacher recognised a spark, wanted to foster it. That must have been a very disorienting experience. Well, yeah, and there's a part of me that doesn't blame the individual teachers. It's the system. When I was young in school, the closest thing to dyslexia was a thing called word blind, which is really weird. Somebody was word blind. I never heard the term dyslexia until I was in my twenties. If you think about poetry, I love Shelley, the poet, but I remember a teacher in school giving me a, a verse of Shelley and telling me to read it. And when the teacher got back in 10 minutes, I should tell her what it meant. I just read it and I couldn't understand these strange words. And there was no context. I mean, it now is one of my favorite poems of all time, <laughs> but at the time, I thought, what is he going on about? Who's Cassaray? Nobody explained to me that Cassaray was a government minister and, and this poem was about the Peterloo massacre and all this stuff. I mean, it would have been right up my street. So it's the system, you know, and um, the, the, the curriculum, which can seem very rigid. And I've had, you know, I, I, I know this because teachers have told me that, you know, they want to open up or they want to talk about this, but it's not part of the curriculum. There's no spare time at the moment when it comes to teaching, you know, it's, it's a very full on job. So creativity needs space and needs time and it's individual. You can't teach everybody the same. And it's very difficult for teachers to do that nowadays. We really need people who set, make these curriculums and people in power, if you like, to understand the importance of art, not just financially. I know people will say, oh, you know, it, the creative industries does this and does that. And I do lecture on a course in creative industry, but that's not what it's about. It really is about people expressing themselves. It's about the mental health of the nation. And it's about giving people a voice. And that doesn't mean being out on a demonstration, that doesn't mean writing radical poetry. That may mean expressing your love for something. That may mean expressing your dreams about something. You know, it, it, there are so many possibilities when it comes to art. And I think 
but something that the education system as it's set up now is very it just it's very difficult to kind of handle individualism you know yeah and it's interesting that it wasn't school that gave you that it was spaces like church and clubs where you realized that the power of the spoken word was something really special what did it feel like when you realized that you could speak and people would listen there was not one moment there was many moments i remember when i was in birmingham i used to perform in like africa caribbean youth centers and churches as you said and i remember a guy came up to me <laughs> and this is going to sound really weird but he came up to me and he went hey benjamin i said what what man he said i think white people would like your poetry <laughs> <laughs> you must understand like i was in this caribbean world in england and not performed outside it you know and also i always felt again i mean i i don't want to sound like i'm racially profiling people but i always i also felt that white people liked the very quiet poetry only on the page and you know, and, and to be a, a white poet, you had to be dead and male. It helped. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, so then I started performing. You know, I went to London and then I was uh, really lucky. I got picked up into a scene with uh, names now that are household names, Rick Mayo, Dawn French, Alexis Sale, people like that. But I do remember in all this, a woman coming to me um, and she said, you're going to be around for a long time. This was after the performance. She said, you're going to be around for a long time. And I said, how do you know? Why do you know that? And she said, I don't know anything about poetry, but I know there's no one like you. There's nobody doing the kind of thing you do. And because of that, I think you're going to be around a long time. And just recently, I've made contact with that woman again. And she's now in the late 60s. And she said, I told you. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Oh, my God. <laughs> to answer your question directly, I thought nobody wanted to listen to me before when I was a kid. I thought everybody hated me. You know, your parents, I mean, they don't really hate you, but, you know, they don't want you to do things that you want to do. The police hated me. Society hated me. All these white people hated me. Everybody hated me, and they wanted to oppress me, and they didn't want to listen to me. Again, I don't want to get too heavy, but we know the story about George Floyd. I've been there. You know, I remember saying I can't breathe and thinking I'm going to die here. And nobody cares. All those people on the radio, all those people on the television, all those people talking, 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 dancing, doing this, they don't care. Then suddenly I started doing poetry. And I found that, that a lot of people do care. And, and that was the major thing, you see. That's why, especially my early poetry, it was so political. And it was so much not just about me, but it was about the oppression I saw women experiencing and other people, you know. I was talking about disabilities and stuff like that, even though I'd never really experienced things myself. But I knew what it was like to feel that I had no voice. Then when I found my voice, I wanted to give voice to other people. And you do dedicate your autobiography and... Um... The Life and Rhymes of Benjamin Zephaniah, Fracking Reed. Um, and you dedicate that to yourself because say, there was a time when you didn't think you'd live to see 30. And that's that quite a heavy thing to hold. That's really true. You see, what happens when you write a book, a publisher will come to you and they say, right, you know, who do you want to dedicate it to? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, this is my book. Yeah. This is my life. I'm going to dedicate it to myself because I never thought I'd reach this point where a publisher, never mind people that read it, is interested in, in my life. And I really thought, sorry, I didn't think, I said it to people, I'm not going to reach the age of 30. You know, I really believed that. And, and I remember my 30th birthday, something really strange happened. Um, I got very depressed <laughs> because I thought, oh, do this again, and I'm 60. I'm 60, is really old. And I, and I didn't think that I've lived that much. And it's a, it's a very long story, which I won't be able to go into now. But I ended up in a police station, wrong for an arrest, and the police still apologise. Um, you know, but literally, I'm driving home on my 30th birthday, got arrested. So I came out of that police station depressed. 
<laughs> it doesn't say happy birthday, <laughs> however you look at it. No. Since then, I've had um, one near-death experience in particular that was a medical thing. It was just a burst appendix, you know, and, and I remember thinking, well, if I die now, whew, I've done a lot, you know? And so I, I listen to a lot of people who've had similar experiences. And one of the things we all say is that, you know, we have to appreciate every day, especially when you get to a certain age. I remember after my near death experience, everything that I saw that was natural, like a bird or a tree, it just looked more beautiful. And if I saw for the next week or so, if I saw a beautiful piece of art, a beautiful piece of dance or something, I just appreciated it so much more, you know, <laughs> it is, it's amazing. Yeah. You are now back in the world of dance. Surprisingly, through Ron Bear's production of Peaky Blinders, we should explain briefly to anyone who hasn't seen the TV series, what is Peaky Blinders? Well, it's a gangster drama, TV drama, set in the 1920s, 30s. It technically goes from the end of the First World War to the beginning of the Second World War. And it's set in Birmingham, which is where I come from. And it's about a gang who fought together in the First World War, come back to Birmingham and became the Peaky Blinders. There were lots of gangs in Birmingham at the time, but the Peaky Blinders are the most notorious. There's a little bit of truth in it. Um, the writer, Steve Knight, likes to base his stories on truth, but then he develops them and, and they evolve to become fiction. But there's strands of truth in it. It's beautiful to watch. It's filmed very, uh, although it was a TV drama, it's very filmic. I'm not very good at describing these things. And I play a character called Jeremiah Jesus. A lot of people say, you know, was there a black guy in Birmingham hanging up with these gangsters in the 1920s? Well, my character is based on a real character. In, in the old days, when the British had its empire and Africans and Jamaicans and all these people used to fight for the British. They would have the Jamaican regiment or the, you know, North African regiment. But for some reason, this guy, he fought with the British regiment from Birmingham. And when he went back to Jamaica after the war, he missed his friend so much that he came back to Birmingham and ended up on the streets preaching hell and damnation to kind of sinners and fornicators, <laughs> but at the same time being kind of half a gangster. <laughs> um, so my character is based on a real character. And so it's not just um, tokenism or anything like that. That world of kind of the marginalised kids, the Irish kids, the traveller kids, the black kids, though it's a couple of generations old, that was very much the world you grew up in, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, when I was growing up in Birmingham, when we talked about multiculturalism, um, we talked about the Irish, the Greeks, then the Caribbeans just started coming. And then I remember when the Asians started coming. Multiculturalism in Birmingham wasn't a black and Asian thing. And people must remember that about Britain when they start complaining about foreigners or whatever. You know, that Britain has always been multicultural. You can go, you can talk about the Huguenots, you can talk about the Angles, you can talk about the Saxons, you can talk about the Juts, the Sillas. How far do you want to go back? It's always been multicultural. We do it really well. The problem is when something goes wrong, everybody thinks it's the end of the world, you know? But most yeah. of the time, people are just getting on with people, you know, most yeah. of the time. Yeah. You never hear in the news today in Handsworth, the Irish got on really well with the Jamaicans and nothing happened. <laughs> no. you know, I mean, it just doesn't make the news, you know? Wow, a, a black girl is marrying a white guy. Wow, it doesn't make the news because we just get on with it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Now, uh, Pinky Blinders has become this dance theatre piece by mm -hmm. Ron Bear. Um, did you get to, because you've, you've done the narration 
which is uh, corded, but did you also get to hang out with the dancers and see the work come together? Well, I saw it at various stages. There's a beautiful trailer that they've done, for, for example, where I make a very quick appearance. I was there on that day, hanging out with them. And then I saw a rehearsal. I saw about two or three rehearsals. And I saw a dress rehearsal the night before it opened. And so I didn't get to know them very well because they're so hardworking and they're just doing their stuff. But I saw it evolve. It, it was a great thing. I had a similar experience before with a, a dance company called Irie Dance Company, where I did a narration for them as well. And with that, it was recorded, but every now and again, I would do it live. I literally would stand there and the dancers would dance around me. With Steve Knight, first of all, I mean, I was on the, I was on the set of Peaky Blinders, actually, and Steve Knight came to me and he said, um, we are thinking of doing Peaky Blinders as a ballet. I went, what? <laughs> you know, a ballet, you know what I mean? And then somebody did say to me, well, you know, ballet can do a lot of things, lots of different ways of telling a story, which I know is true. He did say to me that we want you to be a part of it. And that I would be the only person from the TV series. Obviously, the, the other actors are not really dancers, not as far as I know. But then as it evolved, we realized, of course, that it wasn't ballet. I mean, it was a mixture of dance forms. And so we stopped calling it ballet. I think it's a beautiful thing. I mean, when I watched it not so long ago, it's just very emotional sitting there and not just hearing my voice, but just from seeing a very early rehearsal to seeing what it now is, is great. And I just... I wish I could do half of the things that those cats are doing with their bodies. They like to do mine, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, you are a martial arts guy. You're a Tai Chi guy. You are a very physical person. I am, yes. I've always danced. I've always loved going to, you know, clubs and nightclubs and stuff like that. I, but I've never really danced in an organised way. But I am very physical. And some people, Tai Chi people and martial arts people can get very... Um, upset when what they do is referred to as um, dance. But if you look at Tai Chi, a lot of people will see elements of dance in it. And there is, I think the problem with a lot of the Tai Chi practitioners is that they look at the West and they think Western people have really toned down Tai Chi. So it's a kind of meditation and it's very floaty and it's very dancey. It's, it's a killer martial art. It just looks really slow to the Westerner. But every move you are doing <laughs> is dangerous, right? Yeah. Benjamin, when I told our producer, Sarah, that you were going to be coming on the podcast, her email back just said, OMG, and then about 25 exclamation marks she was very yeah. excited because <laughs> she'd encountered your work like a lot of us have like a lot of people do when she was quite young and it really meant a lot to her it really spoke to her you must so often meet people who feel that your work has had a huge impact on you. and that must be quite a i don't know quite a humbling thing quite an exciting thing it is humbling I, I, I didn't realize at the time, you know, I was just doing what I was doing. And it's only now I meet people of all ages, you know. I meet children at school who are reading my poetry and they will say, you know, they get turned on by poetry and they don't really normally like poetry. Then I meet uh, other people who will talk about sometimes political campaigns or something like that that happened in the 80s. And, and they say, you were there. And I, I, I don't know what to say. I, I, I'm just... Um, from somebody that had no voice to somebody that gave voice to people, that inspired people. I just, sorry, I'm getting a bit emotional because I do. I, 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 that's another thing that happens as I get older. I start crying a lot. Um, I'm just glad that I dedicated my life to giving people a voice. And, you know, I always said that I'm not perfect. I've always talked about my mistakes. And I think that's helped in a way because I didn't come from a background where my parents read books to me and I had lots of books around me. I didn't come from a background that was very, you know, political where people sat down and 
you probably heard me say this before, and I'm, but I'm going to say it again. You know, I was raised sexist. That's how my father and my uncle and everybody, ra- you know, raised me. There's a point in my life when I went, no, this is not right. I've got to turn this around. It's when it comes to a kind of people who are kind of racist by ignorance, I always say, give them a chance. It may be something to do with their upbringing. It doesn't automatically mean they're bad people. It means that they've got to change. And we can all change. We can all try and improve ourselves. And that's all I've been trying to do in my life. And as I'm doing it, I'm writing about it. <laughs> I'm expressing <laughs> it, you know. And it's all like exposed out there. And if that, if that inspires other people, that's a great thing. Because I am completely uneducated. I don't think I am even sophisticated. I think I'm a street poet that's just been getting away with it. And when I'm on stage, I don't think everybody agrees with me, but I think they say, well, at least he's got up and he's speaking for himself. Benjamin, I'm going to stop. I'm going to let you go. But there is one last question, Mm -hmm. which is, um, why does dance matter to you? Why does dance matter to me? Because I think people express themselves in many ways. And I know that I have watched some dance and been driven to tears with its meaning. If you ask me to to repeat what the dancer did, I can't do it. But the way that that dancer expressed themselves is just so beautiful and it tells a story which can only be told in that way by that person. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, I also think that if you look at the evolution or whatever you want to call it of mankind, we have always been dancing. We've always heard rhythm and then had a physical response to it. In every culture around the world, I mean, when you see a culture or a political entity that outlaws dance, you know they are really <laughs> oppressive. <laughs> you know, how can you outlaw people responding to sound or even responding to no sound? You've seen it recently <laughs> people who can't hear you know, just expressing themselves through dance. How can you make that illegal? You know, so that's why dance matters. And these people who want to tell people that they can't dance or girls can't dance or boys can't dance or whatever, whatever it is, they do that because they know that dance matters. Benjamin, thank you so so much it's i feel kind of connected to the world through this conversation it's kind of feel like we've, we've kind of gone out into the world with everything we've spoken about it's been really beautiful thank you thank you very much we don't set out to make our guests cry i promise but how moving it is to think of the lives benjamin has touched and transformed I hope you enjoyed listening. Do let us know. I'm at Mr. David Jays on Twitter and the RAD is at RAD Headquarters. And on our show notes, there are also links to Benjamin's work and to Ron Bear's production of Peaky Blinders, which tours the UK in 2023. And though this is the final episode of this season of the podcast, please do subscribe so that you're the first to hear when our next season, with more incredible guests, is ready to launch. Our guest today was Benjamin Zephaniah. And I'm so sad to say that the RAD team behind Why Dance Matters, Celia Moran, Melanie Murphy and Charlie Strachan, are moving on from the Academy. They've been nothing but brilliant and they'll be so missed. Our artwork is by Bex Glendinning and Sarah Miles, our producer, and me, David Jays. Well, we aren't going anywhere. Take care, and we'll see you next season.